I hate this new version of Zoom, it's annoying. We're all gonna to have to do cake in a minute, so uh, get it to your hand, that's all I'm gonna say. So us usual rules apply, use the chat box to introduce yourself. Um, it's all gonna be about sharing ideas. And while um, Matt and I are chatting, uh, please do keep yourself on mute, but when we come to the end of it and you wanna ask questions, it's a, a bit of a free for all, but not a massive rammy, please, because we can't cope with that. Maybe that's a Scottish word. But for those of you that haven't been to a cafe before, yes, those are the pictures of what I'm going to be eating that my son made. He was off school this week, so he got given the, the exercise of making some cakes for today. Um, and he made this via Zoom with Granny, so there's some with Granny as well. So cakes to the ready people, please. So in the usual spirit, we are all about sharing and supporting. We're also very resourceful, I think you'll find. Um, hopefully inspirational, and we are very good at working as a team, which means we are a great community. So without further ado, I just wanted to give you a bit of an update of what we're doing. And Michael might be interested in the first one. Um, we're down at Crest. Um, Crest is down Yorkshire, no, uh, Shropshire direction, sorry, Yorkshire, Shropshire moment. Re reword that. Um, if you're familiar with the STEM projects at school, they often run competitions for schools along certain themes. And um, Crest down there, and Vicky's joined us before, are running a theme on rural mobility. So the schools in that area are all going to have the challenge of coming up with projects um, to help solve the problem of rural mobility. How exciting is that? We're going to get the younger generation coming come giving us solutions. So we're working closely with the guys at Crest and the STEMs. So on the 22nd of June, if you want to join us, um, we're going to be, SRITC are going to be speaking with the young people, explaining some of the, the key challenges but also opportunities of rural mobility to help inspire them and then what i've agreed with them is that the winners the top three to five um submissions we will take their um suggestions and when we run the gathering in september we will see if we can make some of these happen so that's going to be the challenge so that's going to be our workshop so that would be great because we can make young people's ideas a reality they're also looking for judges to help look at the um submissions so if you're Wanting to do that and help out or provide inspiration and just give a five minute wee spiel to these uh, young people, then please just drop me an email, put something in the chat and we can coordinate that. Also good news, we've got some funding that we applied for with Glasgow Caledonian University and we are going to have a student called Eve Parker, welcome to the team, who's going to be looking at some digital aspects um, of what SRITC um, can work on and improve because obviously we're all volunteers so if we can get somebody in to help that's even better. The other breaking news is that we're in the midst of just finalising and waiting for the process to complete for SRITC to become a community interest company limited, guarantee, limited by guarantee. So that will give us a bit of structure and we will also hopefully then be able to uh, open a bank account, which brings me to the wee plea. If somebody out there has an hour a week that they could help us out, it's not even going to be an hour, um, just that's got a bit of a financial head on them that could help us out, that would be really appreciated um, because it's something that we need to address for the kick. Um, as I said, lots going on. We've got the Scottish Rural Parliament recommendations from the session that we ran back in March. That's going into the Rural Manifesto, which is going to the Scottish Government. So we've got about eight um, key asks, not mood specific, mood specific. Um, but that's exciting because we're getting to put that in front of the Scottish Government and obviously we're producing a summary report. Nearly there, we've had an article in the Scotsman, which was from the last cafe, that was Alistair, which was fantastic to see. And then finally, on the 30th of September, we've got the gathering that's taking place and the Scottish Mobility Cluster, which some of you may have heard about, which is funded through Scottish Enterprise, will be hosting one of those sessions. And I'm also glad to say Simon's here from 42. Uh, they've provided some additional funding. So thank you for that to help with the gathering. And so uh, have Scottish Rural Action who are going to be supporting us. So lots there to digest, I'm afraid, um, but all good news. Um, as you know, the gathering is going to be on the 30th of September. Um, it will be online. So thank you to those that filled in the surveys. But for now, it's going to be online with a twist. So we need your help to be able to make some of the twist happen. Alex is going to put in the chat box the link that will just save the date in your diary for now and show that you're, you're happy to come along at the moment and we'll send out further details and the programme in due course. But on that note, we are looking for speaker suggestions from communities, organisations relating to mobility hubs or 20 minute neighbourhoods or projects that have 
decarbonization or environmental positive impacts. So if you've got suggestions, it's somebody you know, it's your own project, then please put that into the chat as well. Because I'd really like to make sure we can include as many people as possible. And my challenge is aside from maybe my welcome uh, notes, the whole thing will not involve any PowerPoint. So it will be the usual Jenny, something different. And the final bit of this is the twist. Um, we may be online, but what we want to do is to include a social angle on it, and this is global. So hopefully Azure will be our Japanese champion, but we're looking for people in your area, so yourself, just to say, yep, yeah, I'm happy to be the, the key contact for this area, and we'll org organize and we'll help you organize bringing people together in your local area so that you can go and get a beverage or two, um, and we can have a chat, and there'll be a bit of work to do in the pub. We're taking the workshops to the pub. Um, so this is us just trying to future-proof any sort of future lockdowns that may take, might take place. So please, again, put that into the chat box if you're happy to help out um, or, or drop me an email. So that's enough of me talking. I'm now going to introduce Matt. Um, Matt and I are going to do this slightly differently today. Um, we're going to have a bit of a chat, a bit of an interview chat. Um, and now and again, he's going to pop in and out of a presentation just to show you bits and pieces. But I didn't want it to be the same old that you get on webinars where it's just death by PowerPoint. So trying to move away from that. So I'm going to hand over to Matt, who's going to introduce himself and the routing company. And then I'm going to start the interrogation. You ready for this, Matt? I'm ready. I'm ready. Hi there, guys. I think I've met quite a, quite a few of you on the call. So it's good to uh, see all of you again. Um, so my name's uh, Matthew Kendrick. Um, I work for a uh, US startup called The Routing Company. Um, and we have been present within Scotland over the last year. Um, I joined The Routing Company last year in about July. So we're just coming up to a year now. Um, before that, I worked as a solicitor down in London dealing with litigation and um, family law. Um, one of the reasons why I made such a dramatic shift away from the, the legal sector was I'd become very tired of um, the sort of dealing with the broken pieces of something rather than actually building up something new. Um, so the opportunity to work with the routing company and actually get to build something and see things grow um, was something that very much appealed to me. Um, and I'm hoping that that'll be a theme that you guys uh, sort of get from this interview and from the things that I share with you, that it is about sort of developing together, growing together, um, and doing different things um, together to make mobility and transportation better for everyone. Um, so what is it that we actually do? So we do two things. One thing that we did with High Trans last year was we created a data um, sharing platform. Um, so we're in the process of collecting all modes of sort of land transportation data um, to be able to help provide high trans and people at various levels of the transportation system with insights into the transportation network so that they can make um, better decisions and better funding cases um, and actually demonstrate through numbers rather than anecdotally um, the value of the services that they provide. So I'm going to stop um, you there. I just want to know, how did you get the funding to do this project? What, how did this come about? Yeah, so this was, it, it's a really interesting uh, way that Scotland has, um, that does funding. So we got this through what's called um, CivTech. Um, so CivTech is a quasi-government body um, that deals in uh, effectively acceleration programs. So once a year, and actually it's coming up soon again, so those of you that are interested should go to their website as they uh, will be having CivTech um, 6.0 coming up. Um, but uh, for us, it was CivTech 5.0. And they ask 10 questions, which they then submit for you to sort of say, what would your solutions to this be? Um, and so the one that we had to answer was uh, one placed by Hytrans, um, which was related to, um, and I will share it on my screen now, was um, how can we use technology to create a smart and sustainable travel network in remote and rural areas? Um, so what we went to them with was we said, this is what we do. Um, this is how uh, we would propose solving this question. Um, and we were luckily chosen to go along the journey with them um, and are currently working on delivering um, that at the moment. And you can see one of the key aspects to that behind me, which is our um, sort of data sharing platform that we created for them. So before I look at this, how was the CivTech process? Because for many people out there, they probably don't know how CivTech works. They're probably used to normal procurement processes, um, which obviously is a bid and a proposal and submitting a tender. That's not how CivTech works. So this might be of interest to communities and organizations and other countries out there of the unique aspect of CivTech. 
Yeah, so um, I guess one of the things that people probably recognize is that it's really hard to get procurement moving at speed, um, especially within sort of the technology center. So what CivTech did is they kind of do this um, exercise where it is a tendered process, but it's one that's more the user um, that you would see online. So as I said, they asked 10 questions. Um, you submit a proposal as you would, as if it was normal procurement. Um, you go to an interview. Um, if you're selected, you're usually selected with two other um, companies and you go through what's called the exploration stage. Um, and so that's two weeks where you get to work with your challenge sponsor. So in our case, that was Hydrans to say, well, this is what we initially proposed. Let's get some information. Let's get some data. Let's talk to you about how this um, might, might, might look if we were to um, implement it. Um, and then you get the chance to affect it, to submit another proposal and do another presentation. And the idea is, is that over those two weeks that you do at the exploration stage, um, you refine what it is that you're offering, you can make changes to it. Um, and then you, if you're successful, you then go on to what's called the accelerator. Um, and the accelerator is about a two to three month program where um, as a startup business, you get a lot of support from the Scottish government in terms of how do you run a startup? You know, how do you do the accounts? How do you do the marketing? How do you know what your business proposition is? Um, as well as getting to work very closely with your challenge sponsor for saying, you know, what data do we need? Who do we need to speak to? Um, who are the, you know, who, who are the end users that are going to be impacted by what is it that we propose to build? And so you collaborate together to refine and develop the solution. Um, and then we were fortunate enough that um, after the accelerator finished. Um, High Trans was happy to go into what's called a pre-commercial agreement with us, which means that we are continuing to develop um, our solution with them um, and working with them to make sure that we produce something that's um, that's meaningful for for themselves and for their their constituents. So I'm going to take the, the, the bit at the bottom on the right hand side, because I think this is really important. You've got written there historically the hardest transport problem for communities to solve. And I'm going to expect everybody's going to be nodding their head here. Um, and that's that is true, as is the challenge of data in all of this. So how did you address both of these? <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things that we did in terms of, um, so one of the things we did when we were looking at this problem is we said, sorry, let me actually go back a little bit. So in the in our initial presentation, what we said to them is, is we said, look, we can provide you with this on-demand service, which is, you know, effectively an Uber-styled application. Um, and then our technology underneath that's able to pull everybody together um, in the most efficient way. And that's how we propose solving the, um, the issue of uh, rural transportation, which was the fact that if you're running fixed line bus routes, they can be very ineffective when there's low population density and low amount of people adopting it. Um, what we discovered during the exploration stage was that we were very much looking at putting the cart before the horse um, in that it wasn't just that um, there were these inefficient bus routes that we could replace and do um, on-demand services with, but that there were actual data gaps in terms of how readily accessible data was to, um, to High Trans and its partners. You know, I'm going to ask this, what sort of data gaps? You know me, I always love asking this question. Yeah, so one of the big data gaps that we found was um, in relation to community transportation um, and even in, in relation to some of the larger operators. So um, in community transportation, what we found is while they were producing regular reports is it wasn't a, you know, day by day report. It wasn't a every 30 seconds report, five seconds report, um, as you might see in sort of an urban setting where there's sort of technological um, assistance with it. It was people submitting things on the back of paper. Um, on Excel sheets. Um, there was one that we saw where in terms of how far have you traveled today, it said at the back of Greg's to the hospital, which absolutely fine when you're living it and working it. But for someone higher up along the chain, it's I don't actually know what the distance is between Greg's and the hospital. You know, how far did you actually travel today? Um, and so those are the sort of data gaps that we were talking about. Um, as well find... as being able to access um, bus data as well. So although you have access to, you know, things like the VIX feed is it wasn't in an easily digestible format. 
I think you're going to find that our international uh, attendees today are sitting there going, this is actually the same for us. It's not just a Highlands of Scotland problem. It's a, it's a global problem for rural mobility and for this type of solution. So you've got written there, and I'll let you move on to a different slide when we're after this. Creative solutions. Now, you're going to have to get creative. And one of them, I'm guessing, is also related to COVID. Yep. So, um, yeah, so, so we did have to get a bit creative. Effectively, what we said was um, rather than going in with this full uh, on-demand solution that we had, we said, let's strip it back just to data collection. So we took all of our ability to track GPS, track location, track passengers, and we said, how do we break this down into the, the simplest application that we can, which allows people to provide the data that you would see from larger operators, but effectively at no cost to themselves, uh, except for need, needing a smartphone. So that was the way that we got creative in terms of collecting data. Um, and then in relation to COVID and how we're, we, we kind of sort of responded to that, is that more affected our on-demand um, sort of um, uh, product and in terms of limiting spaces and providing services that kind of responded to um, uh, responded to COVID vaccinations and things like that. I think you've got a slide, haven't you, that relates to the COVID vaccination, the sort of the bus that you've got with West Coast Motors and things. Do you want to just share that one and explain what you've managed to do with COVID? Because I know a lot of people will be interested to hear this. Yeah, so what we did was with, and again, I really want to sort of harp on about this idea of collaboration, is that the only reason why this has worked and why we've been able to move at what has become apparent to me as a very rapid pace is because of the partners that we have is it was, you know, High Trans looked at us and they said, yes, we like what it is that you're offering. We want to work with you. High Trans then, you know, also looked and said, here's an innovator within the sort of bus space, which was West Coast Motors. Let's see if they want to work together on, on delivering a full solution. So I think before anything else, none of this happens without deep collaboration with the people that you're working with. Um, but what we did with West Coast Motors is that we launched our uh, our full on-demand service with them um, initially with the idea that it would help serve uh, COVID vaccinations. So they had operating hours that they were able to amend or change um, to deal with when the hospital or doctor surgeries were doing extended hours for vaccinations. Um, we were able to limit the number of seats within the vehicle so that people were able to socially distance without you know, anybody necessarily having to be rejected. Um, and so we were able to very rapidly um, turn around a plan of let's get, um, you know, uh, an on-demand service for people that potentially can't take a fixed line service or don't want to take a fixed line service because it is the middle of, uh, of COVID and be able to take them to, to their appointments when they needed it. Um, and I think in the end, we were able to turn around that project in the span of, of eight weeks. So that's from inception of should we do something together to vehicles on the ground, taking people to where they needed to go? And I think one of your other slides, and I've only briefly people seen this presentation, so I'm having to do this from memory, has some symbols of red through them. Because you've used the word on demand. And I do think for this situation, it's all about marketing and how you market it to people. So why do you put those on that screen, on that slide? So I think one of the things I said to Jenny was I didn't want this sort of like interview slash presentation to just be a fluff piece of, oh, look how great the routing company is. And this is what we do. And this is how we're we're changing the world, so to speak, is I said, I also wanted it to kind of actually give meaningful kind of suggestions of, of how to run, um, you know, other pilots like this. Um, and one of the things that sort of jumped out to us very, very early on is that the term DRT and the term dial a ride is at least within the UK and probably internationally um, very much a poisoned uh, poison chalice at this point in time. Um, the idea that you get when you talk about it is this is something that's um, only for the older generation. It's for people that don't use technology. Um, it's something inefficient. And I think um, without revealing who, who, who it was that I spoke to, someone referred to it as the fifth wheel um, of transportation uh, within, their, within their country. And so it's very much this idea that it's the, you know, the sickly child of, of transportation when that's no longer the case, is the technology now is there for a very viable service to be put in place that can serve everybody, not just a very small 
amount uh, of the population. And so I think as part of it, in terms of as a marketing um, strategy, it's move away from DRT, move away from the term dial a ride, because those terms are very much going to limit who you can actually speak with uh, or who's going to be picking up your service once it starts getting out there. Yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly. And um, I'm sure Rachel Murphy and others are going to have comments about the marketing and the wording um, of services in rural communities. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much longer with you, Matt, because I'd rather people ask lots of questions. But I do wish you to go to that delightful um, coded screen where we're talking about data, because I think this is for me, probably one of the biggest challenges that we have for flexible transportation and me meeting needs, because we've touched on it briefly, but do you want to just expand upon it? Yeah, sure. So um, I think probably one of the things I'll show just before I expand on this is if we go back to this screen here, um, which I've just uh, lovingly titled the Zoom and Enhance screen, is you can see this is the visual representation of the data that we, we collect with HITRANS. Um, so you can see in that first slide, that's all the journeys that have been done within the high trans area over the last hour. The second slide is all of the journeys that have been done um, in the West. And the third slide is all the journeys that have been done um, in Danoon in Danoon area. Um, now, what you'll see on that last slide is you'll see arches that are connecting um, th that are connecting different points. So those arches are connecting uh, where someone's been picked up and where their end destination has been. Um, and the reason why that's relevant is because that's not something that we've been provided with from the data feed. Um, that's something that we've had to apply mathematics to to work out. Because unlike within London, where you tap in and tap out in terms of your journey, um, within sort of more regular bus services, when you leave the bus isn't necessarily um, tied to when you got onto it. Um, so we created a mathematical model um, that says this is the average journey times, this is the average kind of like length that someone's on a vehicle. So these are the ones that are there. Um, and it's relevant because it gives you a much richer sense of where people are traveling to and where people are traveling from. I see people nodding their head going, I really want this. I'm not going to ask you for costs, but it doesn't break the bank, does it? And working in collaboration with people, this is really feasible. Yeah, no. So this is so at the moment um, with, within the highlands and islands in particular, um, because of the fact that we're contracted with high trans is um, the, the likelihood is that for the people who have vehicles on the ground. So we're talking, you know, CTA, um, small operators, people that aren't running um, commercial services is this will be something that they'll be able to access uh, at, at no or very, very limited cost um, in the future. Um, while we're still within this kind of developmental phase is I can say that there is no cost to actually go in with this system at all because we're still developing it out as something that that fits exactly what it is that the people want. So while we're doing that and effectively well, the value to us is what is it that you need? How do we how do we present that to you in a meaningful way? It is we don't intend on on charging for the service. Um, but just going back to that that data point is what you saw there. As I said, was the the visual representation of everything. So what is it that's needed to generate that? So what's needed to generate that is GPS location, um, routing numbers, uh, and occupancy data. And that's you know it seems very simple on that. But there's, there's multiple ways in which that can kind of be broken down. Um, so one of the things is, is that for one of the set of operations that we get is we only get um, updates every 30 seconds. Um, so whereas in addition to um, just seeing those points uh, plotted on, on, the, on the screen, we're also to actually able to see where the vehicles are going and moving back and forward. Um, the reason why I'm not showing that sort of at, at this point in time um, is because it, it's live services, so there's some GDPR things that we don't necessarily want to fall foul of, but more than happy to show you guys simulations from, um, from actual just testing we've done one-to-one -one if necessary. But when the sort of updates from the system are 30 seconds apart as opposed to five seconds, then you don't get the ability to track vehicles in the same way. Um, the same thing is there for things like route number, operator number, depot number. Um, so the way the system set up at the moment is you can see everything, or you can see one vehicle, um, and that's not actually that's not that's not helpful for operators. That's not helpful for high trans. Um, so what we're doing is we're going in and we're actually dividing it out by other information. Um, so you'll you'll see there is some of the things that we're looking at is things like line reference number, um, uh, vehicle monitoring reference number, 
who the uh, operator is, and then we can actually pull that out um, as, as needed. So here, as you can see here, it's there's everything. This is everything that's being done by West Coast Motors, and this is everything that's being done in Danoon. Um, and so we've been able to sort of break it down into smaller and smaller chunks. And the idea is, is that we'll be able to actually provide information on, you know, how efficient is your route, uh, route, um, you know, if you have less than 30% of people on there for the entire time that you're running it, is that a service that is, that, that is a good service or would it be better replaced with a car scheme, seat, uh, some sort of community transportation or something like that? And so that's why the, the, these data points are really important. So before we, we stop and um, get people to fire you questions, because I really haven't interrogated you that much, others will, I'm sure. Um, is this your five point list that as a community organization there, the, this is the sort of data that is going to be required and essential to be able to make something happen? Or are there bits on that list that we don't need to have, but would like to have? Yeah, so um, I think this is probably what, what I would call, so in terms of how often you get updates, so the five seconds one is for our system, is what um, what it's more getting at is the standardization of the data that's being collected. So if you're actually doing things in 30 seconds, 15 seconds, five second intervals, and there's no kind of standard way in which data is being collected, it just makes it harder for people that are trying to produce solutions um, to produce something that makes sense. Um, in terms of what's absolutely necessary, um, GPS location, absolutely. Um, sort of unique vehicle reference number, and I would argue uh, route number as well, absolutely necessary. And, um, and occupancy data is probably the key one, and I think the one that is most contentious at the moment is um, I'm happy to be kind of proven wrong on it just for my cursory look. But in terms of um, the BODS data, which they have in um, England, the bus open data, is occupancy data isn't included on that list when I had a look at um, at our system integrating with it. And if you don't have the occupancy data, you can't actually plot where people are traveling. You can only say where the vehicles are going and coming from. So I think in terms of uh, where do we want to be with um, with this sort of data, I think having occupancy data being open is, is very much a, a necessity as well. Uh, right, I'll let you stop sharing. I know we've got Jane from Hightrans here. So if Jane wants to contribute at any point in time, she just needs to put her uh, camera on or wave her hands or something at me. Um, but if you want to have a look at the chat, um, I'm not surprised Azrael's put something in uh, in Japan. So he's, I, I wonder if Azrael wants to unmute himself as the first question uh, and then we'll throw, throw it open to the rest of you because I'm sure you've got lots of questions to ask. Azrael? Yeah, uh, I think you wanted to give someone else the voice, I believe. No, go for it. Okay, so I just turned on the light. Uh, no, I just, uh, I, I think it was very interesting. So I just like, I was, I mean, I, this kind of like uh, user interface uh, tools are very useful, I think. But I, I wanted to know a little bit more about like, like my experience is that uh, most of the things we try to do in rural areas basically they are blocked because the rural areas do not have enough funding either expertise either funding either willingness to do these things so i was wondering how can you you talk about marketing so i was wondering how can you penetrate into uh, selling these kind of i mean providing these kind of tools and also one thing i made a question is that um what is the the real add value of these tools when it comes about thinking about the effort they need to make to join these schemes or to pay for this? Because there is a value for sure to know these things, but are they willing to pay for this? Are they willing to, to uh, uh, implement these kind of things? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So I'll divide that between two things. So one in terms of um, providing on-demand services um, and then one in terms of the data um, data capture and actually sort of joining this idea of a data platform. Um, so on the on the on demand side of things, um, we are currently with our with one of our pilots that we're running is we are running at about 15 times the amount of people being served um, that were served pre COVID for the same service. So in terms of the number of people that you're getting into the vehicles, it is not just not just statistically higher, it is significantly higher. Um, and when you kind of compare that to things like, for instance, I did a 
Um, just a quick look yesterday at um, sort of taxi occupation. So the same idea of door-to-door -door, um, on-demand services is this, this type of service is a price pointed at around that of a bus and was, um, was serving between, I think it was between 65% and 140% more people um, in a week than a, uh, than a taxi was. So in terms of what are the arguments for it commercially is it's if it's done in the right way, you will get people joining and using the service and it will it will pick up and lower the amount, hopefully, of um, sort of government intervention needed for um, uh, for for running these types of services. Um, from the data capture point of view is again, we're still very much in the in the developmental phase of what this looks like. But the idea is, is that is exactly as you said, is price cannot be a barrier to this. Um, and it has to be sort of put at that level. Because if price becomes a barrier, people aren't going to join, people aren't going to do it, which means that your data is not going to be rich enough to actually draw the sort of inferences and the decision making power that you want. So I think the without sort of going into the nuts and bolts of uh, the decision making is is I can very comfortably say that price point won't be an issue, uh, at least for the data tracking and platform side of things for um, things like communities and um, uh, and uh, sort of at the um, district level for uh, for the government as well. Does that answer your questions, Azrael? Yeah, I just wonder like when you say prices, it should not be a bird. It's like, yeah, it should not be a bird, but I wonder how are you going to build a company if you don't get the right pricing policy? So it's, I mean, it's a trade-off, but uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, well, I, no, I can actually go into a bit more detail for that. The way that we're looking at it in terms of the data tracking is we look at it as in places where you do find inefficiencies and um, things where uh, the fixed line network doesn't work is one of the options that you're going to have available to you is DRT services. Um, and so, whereas, you know, the price point for the data collection and the data usage might be very, very accessible is the idea is, is from our personal perspective as a company, we would then be able to on sell with our full solution, uh, which is actually running an on demand service. It won't always be the case that an on demand service is the right call to make within that community. But from our perspective is if, you know, five local authorities right now know where DRT might be useful. If we get up to 100 local authorities that may know where DRT will be useful, um, it, it, it helps everybody and it helps us as a company as well. So that's where the difference is, is that we wouldn't be looking at being a viable company solely on the back of um, the data collection platform. Right. I see Rachel Murphy mm -hmm. nodding her head away here. So I'm going to get her to introduce herself because not everybody will necessarily know her. Hi everybody, I'm Rachel Murphy, I'm Director of Scotland with the Community Transport Association. So we're the membership body for community transport across the UK. Scotland, we have about 150 members and about half of those work in rural areas. I, I, I have to, obviously the first thing I'm going to say is I really dislike the characterization of CT or Dalaride as the kind of ugly sister of the transport network um, as a whole. I, and it, but I suppose what I can say to temper my frustration with that is, is that I do recognise that perception is, you know, is nine tenths of it. If it isn't a service that people consider as something that they might want or be able to use, then, you know, then that's not obviously not a good thing. So I, so I can see that and I can definitely see how an option like this would allow people to make their CTs maybe a little bit more intuitive and have a, a better understanding of where they sit. I suppose my question, Matt, for you is, do you have any thoughts on how we mix, how we manage to maintain that balance of really improving the data that CTs have, that they can share with the local authority, you know, that sense also that, that users can gain while still protecting what inherently makes them what they are, you know, that kind of, that higher level of accessibility, that focus on community, because as much as the data may tell you that something is an inefficient service, actually, if it connects people with lifeline services, then inherently it is efficient. 
So I suppose it, it's how how do we make this within the, the CT sector? Sorry, the world's noisiest van is driving past my house. How do we how do we make this a tool that benefits the CT sector rather than something that steamrolls over the top? Yeah, I think so. The first the first thing I'd say is I want to make a clear distinction between sort of yeah that idea of perception and naming versus what the actual value of the of the service is because i think like especially the more that we've dug into this is there is no question about the value of ct over the community is more what it was what was literally about the marketing of the naming of the things where it's when people look at it they go that's not a service for me yeah um, is what I was talking about rather than um, any sort of disparaging commentary on, on CT, because I think one of the things that's that, that really drove us when we were building this out was the fact that it was, it, is that this is aimed partially at giving CT a louder voice in the conversation, because they do do so much to kind of keep the communities um, together and keep the communities moving, that it, it's, it's, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's slightly unfair that because they don't have you know an onboard ticketing machine or because they only have access to excel or limited technology um that they're unable to convince people within higher levels of government um as to the like intrinsic value of what they do so that's the the first thing i kind of want to make make very clear is that it's it's about the the marketing of the name rather than the actual service that's going on because the service is is vital and important um and then I think on the second point of how do you keep community transport uh, what it, what it, what it is, even if it's not necessarily um, uh, efficient in terms of, of the monetary, I guess, sort of return, is um, I think what that comes down to, and what I'm really kind of interested in exploring, is how do you model what's considered a good use of um, of resources? Yeah. So of course, maybe maybe it was a bit sort of um, careless of me to kind of frame it as a as a monetary. Um, sort of analysis, but there's a number of other ways to look at it, right? Which is um, you can put it through the framework of, um, you know, what is this in terms of access to lifeline services? Um, so one of the things we can do with the data that we have is say, okay, if we're focusing on CT, um, what percentage of trips that CT are doing are going to places like hospitals or going to places like um, supermarkets or going to places like train stations and things like that. And, and this is what and this is what I mean by saying it, it was a, a way to give them more of a voice is when the data is not there in terms of, well, you know, I've done five trips to the doctors this week. Yeah. Is as soon as you kind of get out of your personal bubble of people that you know, or officials that you deal with, is the fact that you've said that it becomes less important in the sense of, people want to actually see hard data rather than anecdotal evidence. Um, and so if you're able to say, actually, here's my report for the last month, as you can see, we've done this number of trips to the hospital. This means that this is a lifeline service. Um, then, then that becomes a much more compelling case for people to be able to make um, those, th those, those funding requests or grant requests for, for additional support. Um, so that's kind of, kind of what, what I was interpreting your question as. Yeah, and, and I actually think there's something in that which is very exciting, which is all the time they're not sitting in a back room painstakingly writing this stuff out is, is an opportunity to actually be doing more services. Because I do think for a lot of our members, just you know, seeking out this funding and writing all the reports, and you know, we all know how much time that takes. The less time they're doing that and the more time that data is just sendable, um, will make them more able to run more more services, which I think is really exciting. I'm going to ping quickly to Martin because he's overseas, and I think it will be really interesting to see what Martin's experiences are within his area. So I'll let Martin introduce himself and explain what's going on. But Martin's also inputted into the ITF report. I know Lucy's here, so if Lucy wants to interject with any comments from just out with Scotland, just to um, bring bring more value and evidence, that would be great. Martin. Well, um, not really sure what to say today. Um, that's a first. Uh, hmm? So that's a first. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I should have drank a bit more tea or coffee. Um, anyway, um, I think uh, the uh, well, 
what you touched upon uh, in when when you were talking about DRT versus on-demand transport. Also, I'm not um, so happy with using on-demand transport because it's a rather unspecific term. You can call a, a, a pizza delivery services on-demand transport as well as a, a DRT service is and so on. So uh, I, I'm a bit, uh, from a professional point of view, that I'm a bit skeptical about that alternative, but I see the need that uh, I think that's uh, has been driving your concerns as well, that uh, DRT and these small scale transport uh, services are like, uh, easily overlooked by the mainstream. They are like a really like a, a niche product and they are um, um, explaining them to, to the intended uh, potential ridership and uh, making them aware of it. Of these services is more uh, labor intensive and it requires a bit more know-how and intelligence and also marketing than uh, traditional fixed route public transport that's more self-explanatory and uh, that is something that is often overlooked um, both by professional and by community-based services they uh, perhaps the community-based services are even better at uh, explaining what they do because they they tend to be rooted in the community and uh, connected to uh, there's a better connection and in, in, at least in my understanding uh, between the the passengers and the people driving them and the organizers. So uh, there's, there's a better link to the community, but the uh, the professional services are somehow provided from a far away company managed by a far away authority. And uh, um, often the authorities don't really have that much interest in making these services popular because they then they need to pay more subsidies. If there's more, more service provided there, it becomes more expensive. And um, yeah, um, so that's something worth chewing on for, for any kind of... Uh, uh, well, you, you've given me the opportunity to ask Jean hmm? um, a question because you're talking about subsidies and um, yeah. if we have more people on the services, it costs more money. Um, as Jane's heavily involved in this project, I think it's only fair to give her a bit of a, a floor, if that's all right, Jane, um, for her hmm. opinion and thoughts. And I'm sure she'd love more people, more bums on seats. Jane. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So yeah, Jane from High Trans. So we were the ones who launched the challenge last year and got the routing company on board to develop the product. So yeah, a big part of it was to try and increase the efficiencies and capacities, but kind of going back a step to, as Matt was saying, to know, to really get the information and data behind that so that we could make those decisions, I suppose, or help other local authorities or transport providers help to make those decisions. So I think even just a, simple task of well, not simple but going back to basics almost to try and get as much data that's maybe existing already but that isn't digitalized or isn't combined in a way that's easy for people to digest and take forward and then to actually visualize it as um the routing company have created and then almost then trying to bring in a services that maybe aren't there or new things and then that really gives us the gap but the hope was to try and get more people traveling sustainably and are supposed to be aware that there might be these services nearby to them that they don't even know about um particularly kind of community transport and Rachel raised a really good point there about the, this wasn't really the intention to try and almost like shift things around so much that you would lose some of these services it was it was the opposite where it was more trying to see could we help to make them more efficient by providing a tool that lots of these different services could all use um, and would hopefully then help all the services come together so rather than competing even with the fixed line routes that wasn't really the intention either it was just to try and build a better whole connected network by having everything visually there as much as we could can i just say it's nice to see you because i haven't seen you for a while so it's nice to see you I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds exactly what we need in rural mobility isn't it it's actually about an advertising campaign as well to show that those services are on the ground and that they're available to you and that you can use them because quite a lot of the stumbling block in rural areas is not knowing about the services that mm. exist. Um, and then once they know about it, then they can use it. Matt, do you want to add anything else? Um, yeah, it was just a couple of points is I really liked, I really liked the discussion on what you're naming it. Like, are you calling it DRT? Are you calling it on demand? Sometimes that can, yeah, as you said, be confused with things like pizza and stuff like that. And I think um, the interesting point on that is, um, the comment that the people on the ground who are running these services are, are the best people that are able to explain what it is that they do. Um, and I think that 
that that at the is very much at the heart of like why we've seen like success already in terms of the programs that we have launched is because there are people who are like this way of transportation makes sense this is really helpful for people and they're more than willing to kind of go out and, and advocate that point um in their community um and so i think I, I really did like that point and i really do like mm -hmm. that it is uh a bit of a, a debate in terms of should you call it DRT or call it something else is you know what maybe on demand isn't the right name either but I think it's a it's an interesting discussion of, of how do you um, get more people to recognize these services and be out in the um, uh, out out in the world with with them so I think it's it's a yeah it's an interesting um, debate I think. We always have this question about how, as transport professionals, how do you make it sexy? And I don't think we've actually ever cracked it at all. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, I'm going to ping to another CTA individual because he's been very patient, hanging in the wings. Do you want to just introduce yourself and then bring your question and unmute yourself at the same time? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Jenny. Hi everyone, I'm Augie from CTA, uh, Development Officer for Scotland, and I think this is my third week. So. Um, me and Alice have both joined very recently, so um, great to be here. Um, I think one of the interesting things that I thought as well with the points that Rachel mentioned and, and Matt, how you were kind of responding to that, um, was, a, I mean, maybe ideological is, is a big word, but I certainly think there's kind of a narrative, maybe tension is, is a bit dramatic, but certainly maybe a, a bit of a disconnect, certainly in the language between the language of efficiency, maybe, and the kind of the kind of impact that CT has. And I think there's, you know, maybe a, a reticence amongst CT operators, um, uh, perhaps to kind of fall purely based on that metric. And I think the, when you start to use kind of those metrics of trips and passengers and efficiencies without then maybe building in also the awareness that the impact and that you're having on people day to day, um, that that also gets a voice in that metric I think in a way um, there can be kind of a, I don't know, a way, a way that you lose some of that by prioritizing those other metrics. And I think, I think that's certainly something where certainly in terms of semantics and what you call it and how you refer to it, there's an opportunity there to make it almost to integrate that impact into this kind of a platform, because that is the one thing that you always see operators talk about, you know, we helped this, you know, we delivered groceries to this person that really needed it. And, you know, the car might have been empty, but that was what was required. Um, that was a service that was needed, certainly in community aspects. So I wonder if there's maybe an opportunity there to kind of flesh out how how you approach that issue, that translation issue. Um, I think what I think one of the really interesting points on that uh, to say it, it in a very um, sort of yes and way is the way that I kind of looked at it as well is that there's two ways of like analyzing services, right? Is you have your quantifiable data and then you also have your like kind of like analytical and um uh sort of more um qualitative data yeah so the way that we the way that or the, that i looked at it was well if we can handle all of the quantitative data for people and actually get that sort of automated and easy to use then it gives again not just more time to run services but more time to use to get that qualitative data so you know like one of the things when i went down to one of our locations was when they stopped running their dial -a ride service due to covid is it had a major impact on one particular individual in their community you know that person used to get on the bus in the morning um use the bus to go do their groceries go do all of their stops um and go and do you know everything that they needed that day but then in addition to that, they would ride on the bus for a couple of hours because that was their socialization aspect. Yeah. So one of the things that was like, you know, that you could see was a clear pain point was that with COVID coming in and that dial a ride service stopping was they knew that this person wasn't getting a the socialization, wasn't getting out um, and wasn't effectively getting what they needed so it was you know when we were looking at doing this as it was this is going to be great because that person will be able to have access to their um to, to their life again so absolutely agree and i think it's it's not that one should be prioritized over the other but more that if you make one easier then you can spend more time on, on the other as well and get that like real sort of like impact when you're um ma making your cases for why um your services is great and maybe maybe part of the disconnect that I want to be clear about as well is it's not about people having to justify their existence. Yeah. 
is it's it's not about that at all. It's about the fact that CTs and sort of dial ride services and DRT services do a lot of good work that that when I kind of looked at sort of the reporting and things like that was in some ways um, not as um, not as easily accessible for appreciation as what as what it could be. And so that's what the the, the sort of drive was was, you know, as um, as Jane said, it was it, it's not about competing. It's not about getting rid of services. It's not about limiting or saying who's better. It's about in this big sort of framework of all the transportation that we do, where do different sort of transportation um, modes sit? Um, how do we kind of help support the ones that are potentially lagging or that potentially there's a gap in terms of where transportation is? And, you know, the end goal is how do we get people out of private cars and into other modes of either public or um, active transportation? So just in case I've been sort of slightly um, unclear, unclear on that, I just wanted to make sure that that was um, coming across. Yeah, and I'm afraid I know people put hands up and thumbs up and are waving at me, but we're running out of time. So, um, and I'm being selfish actually for once. I have to finish on time at 11:30 because I'm interviewing for my PhD at 11:35 in Australia. So I'm afraid for once we will have to definitely finish on time. Um, I'm not getting the uh, Victorian government in Australia late because we're talking about demand response or dial a ride or on demand or whatever terminology we want to use today. But I'm sure. Um, People, if you want to speak to Matt um, and quiz him even further, then feel free to do so. I'm sure Matt can put in uh, the chat box his, his details. But Matt is also one of our musketeers and obviously, along with 42, one of our, our principal supporters. And I have to say thank you very much, Matt, because he does a lot to help me out in the background and has helped a lot with setting up the kick and all the rest of it. So Matt is one of the good guys and I really appreciate your support, Matt. So a big thank you from me. And I'm sure Jane will probably agree with me that you're probably a good guy to work with. Um, yeah, she's nodding and smiling, uh, which is good news. So please drop Matt a, a message if you want to quiz him further or integrate, interrogate him, because I, I think he's actually got off quite lightly. Do you not think he's got off quite lightly, people, at the moment? Um, right, so just to conclude up, and I can't get my screen share to work, which is just typical, isn't it? Um, actually, no, before I conclude, I'm going to hand to Alex Reed. I didn't do this at the beginning. Alex has some news to share with you, which as a very, very key part of the SRIT team. We're not losing him, so don't worry, he's staying with us, but he has some news to share. So Alex, put your video on. And oh yeah, I'm back. So yes, thank you very much, Jenny. So I'm um, delighted to announce after a little bit of a, how would I put it, um, vacation, shall we say. <laughs> That's not strictly true, I've been very, very busy. As of the 7th of June, I will be working on behalf and with Aberdeen University and the Energy Technology Partnership, who many of you in Scotland will know in our business development role. So for those who knew me in my previous life, pre-COVID, working at the Transport Systems Catapult, which became the Connected Places Catapult, the role I'm going to be doing is pretty similar to that. So it's bringing together the academic community, public sector, private sector around specific funding. It's very much flavored around transport decarbonization because obviously that is a big agenda and it covers both more metropolitan and rural as well so it pretty much complements what I've been supporting Jenny with through SRITC but of course it's broader than that as well so uh, in that regard I'm kind of back and expect to see a bit more of me in various different forums, and, virtual and hope, meetings. And hopefully some people days. will reach out once you've got your new uh, email address and uh, we can yeah. make more projects happen. But conscious yeah. of time, so it's good news and well done, Alex. And he's going to end up following me around, I think, um, because obviously University of Aberdeen is where I'm at as well for the PhD. So just a reminder of what's coming up. I know we've got Lucy here, but Lucy and Laurie will uh, be joining us on 25th of June, all being well, to uh, provide some insights on the work that's been happening uh, on the working group on rural uh, periphery uh, and innovation. So that will be looking at shared mobility, rural mass, business models. Then we're going to have a break, yay, offline um, over the summer. Um, and we're going to then sort of focus on open cafes either side of the gathering uh, for obvious reasons. And then we'll have our last BYOC um, at, in November. 
Some final community announcements. If you happen to be in the Aberlour area uh, on the 12th of June, they're running their sustainable transport event. Um, for those of you that aren't CILT members, Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, you may not have seen this fantastic report on the challenges of future carbon and emissions reductions for rural communities. So I'll put that in the email and you can send it out. And a small plea for me, I will be um, circulating a visitor survey for parts of the Highlands of Scotland in particular. Um, and if you can help me out with the PhD with disseminating it to organisations or groups or businesses, that would be really, really useful uh, and help me along the way. Other than that, just to say thank you very much for joining us today. I'm probably going to have missed something because my brain's not fully engaged. So if I have, I apologise. Uh, but thanks again to all the musketeers who are helping make what we were describing at the area at the beginning phenomenal year for SRITC and to becoming a kick in the next couple of weeks and months uh, really is going to open up doors and provide us with more structure. So thanks again uh, to the partners and supporters. And if you wish to be involved in any shape or form, whether it's as a champion of a workshop in a pub for the gathering or uh, helping out behind the scenes, then just drop me an email. But I'll love you and leave you. Australia calls me and uh, I'm sure your coffee calls you. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Bye.